let's let's get right into it okay uh there is so much going on so much confusion with the iowa caucuses and with the results from both the iowa democratic party and also the uh dnc the dnc decided to to, to take matters into their own hands uh it's it was a massive commotion i think a lot of people are probably confused still even though i've been offering round the clock coverage on this matter and uh, I wanted you, a person who has uh, been reporting on this uh, issue for some time now, and also a person who literally went to Iowa and, uh, and uh, covered the caucuses directly there, uh, to describe to us as, as best as you can what has happened, like the timeline of events, maybe even starting with the DMR poll and its significance. Right. So, right. So the, the political world has, has loved talking about this DMR poll, Des Moines Register puts out a poll on the Saturday before the election, and it's become this like Christmas for political junkies because it has, you know, historically done a great job of kind of nailing um, the order uh, of the, uh, the candidates. And, you know, I think, and partly uh, it's because it has a self-fulfilling effect. Like uh, the yeah. Iowans who aren't paying a whole lot of attention, they, they see the poll, and whoever's at the top of the poll or a second in the poll, they're like, oh, okay, well, that's who's doing well. So that's who I'm going to caucus for. Because you have to think about it. When you go to these you know, elementary school gyms, you're uh, you know, surrounded by the people that live in your community. And most people don't want to be that one person you know, over there voting for Michael Bennett. You know, they they kind of want to <laughs> yeah. look like they're going with the crowd. Yeah. So. So you get a sense of like, okay, the crowd is with Bernie, the crowd's with Warren, the crowd, whatever the crowd's with. Um, and so as a result, the, the, so the poll has its own effect. And then on Saturday night, just before they're supposed to release it, they announce actually, you know, we're not go we're not going to release this. Um, you know, the, the, there was a Buddha judge supporter who was interviewed who said that Mayor Pete's name was not mentioned on the poll. They looked into it. They found out why that was. It appears that there probably was not actually any accuracy issue with the poll because it would have screwed everybody equally because they randomize it. And so, you know, one phone call, Pete's name would be left off. The next phone call, Bernie's name would have been left off. Um, and it was just this one person, this one person who was making calls, but whatever. Uh, it, it, it would have showed uh, 22 for Bernie, 18 for Elizabeth Warren. It actually probably would have given a big boost to Elizabeth Warren. Because Most that likely, would have shown yeah. Of everyone, all the news, and also that, that's what the media wants the to cover. Right? Uh, they were like, oh, you know, huge devil. Elizabeth Warren comeback, and then everybody would have been, um, you know, the, she probably would have, she probably could have picked up another five points um, out of that poll. It's, it's weird, you know, it's a weird turn that history took um, by that not coming out. Um, it, it may or may not have hurt Bernie because people, we're already kind of assuming that Bernie was in the lead because there's been a couple polls already. But if he'd have come out in the Iowa poll as the leader, you know, it probably does, you know, add a point to him, a point or two to him, and it probably hurts Pete a little bit to show that Pete's in, in third place. And they and they accurately had Joe Biden down at down at fourth. Um, so then Tuesday night, when they're uh, you know sending all the the polling numbers into the in the precinct, that that's what. People learned that the, the app um, was a pain in the ass to use, and people, most, most precinct chairs weren't even using it because it was such a mess. Um, the ones that tried to um, were having problems with it. There was then a coding problem that was uh, producing inaccurate data at the, at the party end, and so they just kind of spiked the app and told everybody to, to, you know, to phone in your results. They hadn't set up um, for that, and so... You know, Apparently, a bunch of you know Trump trolls were also <laughs> calling in and drowning out the lines, and so they couldn't couldn't get through. If you think about it, though, they if if they'd have just had a hundred people, you know, in a boiler room taking phone calls, each one of those people would be assigned to about seventeen precincts. That's it. Seventeen people would just text the numbers in or or call the numbers in, and you know they paid sixty grand um, for this app, which is cheap for an app which is why, probably why it didn't work. Um, but even if, you know, if you pay a $15 minimum wage to 100 people for three hours, you know, you're going to spend less than they spent on this app. Idiotic. Um, so anyway, you know, that's, that's, that's where we wound up. 
and no results that night. No, you know, and they're, before, they're, they and, still and before we move on, results. sorry, before, sorry to cut you off, but before we move on from, uh, the application, uh, can we, can we, can we talk about that a little bit? Cause I know while, uh, the, the night was going on, we found more detailed information about the shadow, uh, company called shadow yeah. ironically titled shadow uh, yes. and and um, they had uh, they were very outspoken about their uh, political opinions and the people that work at that company were all ex Hillary staffers now I chalk this up as like regular anti meritocratic uh, uh, who you know style business as usual politics and I think that those people, of course, are uh, establishment figureheads or people who have worked with other candidates like Hillary Clinton. Of course, they're going to get hired for their SMS services, no matter how incompetent they are by other campaigns, such as Biden's campaign, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know if that was uh, verified, if you can verify that or not. That's right, uh, and yeah. also Pete Buttigieg's campaign. For those of you who don't know, the application shadow that uh, DNC or not DNC, sorry, the Iowa Democratic Party and the Nevada Democratic Party both hired for um, bo both hired to do this uh, caucus uh, result delivery was owned by uh, uh, a, a person by the name of Tara McGowan who is married to a, a campaign advisor of Pete Buttigieg's uh, very openly uh, is, is excited about Pete Buttigieg and that's definitely a conflict of interest. Uh, Nevada has since uh, the Iowa failure decided not to uh, use the application anymore despite the fact that they paid what uh, 50 grand Mm -hmm. as well yeah so yeah yeah and your but your original point that it was a dnc as much as the iowa democratic party shouldn't be over that actually no the reporting is that the, that it was the dnc you know that this firm has connections to the dnc it was the dnc that urged the iowa democratic party to to use this use this app and use this vendor and you know most vendors also aren't gonna even put in a bid for this project it's it's an idiotic project um and, and the fault really is with both um, the DNC and the Democratic Party, the Iowa Democratic Party, for even wanting this idiotic app in the first place. You know, it's, it's this goes back to this um, idea where everybody thinks there's some technological solution rather than just thinking through what's the easiest way to do that. But yeah, and then and then you have this kind of uh, cloistered, incestuous group of people who are, um, you know, just kind of self-dealing all the way. And, and they've they've produced this rickety shell uh, of an apparatus of a party apparatus that that like you blow on it in Iowa and it just crumbles. So a lot of people on the left and uh, people who are uh, kind of following this story, not so closely uh, or maybe as closely as they possibly can, have alluded to uh, that uh, this this entire process is rigged against Bernie Sanders. I've even said similar things, but. My definition of what I mean when I say rigged is not necessarily that the caucus results were rigged, even though there were definitely caucus results that were incorrect that happened to accidentally uh, uh, favor Pete Buttigieg. Uh, Bernie Sanders' campaign specifically pointed out 14 of them uh, last night in an email that they sent out to the press. But uh, when I say there is collusion or when I say that this situation is rigged, I mean towards uh, like rigged in the sense that DNC and CNN, especially and other establishment media outlets are collaborating in, in, in a similar fashion, in my opinion, and this is speculation, but in, in my opinion, collaborating in a similar fashion to how they did in 2016. Uh, I think that the slow burn of the results, the slow reveal of the results, especially results that were specifically carved out. Uh, carved around uh, areas where uh, Bernie Sanders was actually performing well, um, and the 75% release, and then the 97% release, and everything uh, leading up to that point, I, I consider that to be an effort, a deliberate effort, most likely, and this is speculation, but deliberate effort, most likely, by the DNC and other corresponding media outlets uh, who are favorable to the DNC that, uh, that, that uh, participated in this process to strip the importance of, uh, of of the Iowa caucus and derail Bernie Sanders' momentum because they considered Bernie Sanders uh, to be the victor. They assumed that he was going to be the victor, and uh, this was frustrating for them. I, it, would you agree with that? I know that was a long monologue. I mean, the, but... the effect of putting out just 62% of the results and showing Buttigieg ahead in the state delegate equivalents uh, is entirely predictable, and it's that the media will start reporting that that 
that Mayor Pete was right when he declared victory early. And, you know, so they did that, you know, fully aware, uh, it appears, that, that, that Bernie had actually won the popular vote and that the um, state delegate equivalents was going to be extremely close. And whether the, in the final accurate tally it, it goes to Buttigieg or Bernie, it's going to go to one or the other by one or two delegates. But that's not the impression that was left by them releasing this 62%. And then, you know, a day or two later, when the satellite caucuses, the marginalized workers, disabled people, um, you know, the elderly students um, who voted you know, in, in kind of special caucuses that were set up before the normal one, when those start coming in and Sanders is surging and it appears that he's going, and, and, he, and just as he overtakes, um, Buddha judge in the New York Times probability of who's going to win caucus. That's precisely when Tom Perez comes out and says, "Enough is enough." You know, I'm calling for a recant, and that that was just absolutely bogus. And it, it was at, at at the very best extraordinarily unself aware um, to to come out and, and choose that moment. And CNN later reported, based on sources of the, the DNC that Perez made that call yeah. because Bernie surged in the satellite caucuses, and that is gross, and that is corrupt. And also, on top of that, Pete Buttigieg had called the Iowa Democratic Party, maybe not the DNC, if I'm not mistaken. I know that these are two separate entities that are working uh, autonomously almost. I mean, they're, of course, still beholden to the DNC because they are a part of the Democratic Party apparatus, but um, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Pete Buttigieg uh, and his campaign personally called Mm -hmm. uh, to halt the results once that, uh, that, that final surge was happening in 97%, uh, mm -hmm. where Bernie Sanders uh, was slated to overtake Pete Buttigieg, where they said these satellite caucuses are being weighed disproportionately. The satellite caucuses, of course, that were predominantly people of color, workers, uh, Ethiopian poultry factory workers, uh, English is a second language, American citizens that were uh, of an immigrant background. Um, uh, Pete Buttigieg personally, or his campaign personally called the DNC or the Iowa caucus, or, sorry, the Iowa Democratic Party to halt the results, to halt the reveal of these results and, and call into question the, the, um, the disproportionate, in their words, uh, uh, electoral power that these satellite caucuses had. I personally find that to be reprehensible. Uh, I yeah. find that kind of ironic, considering Pete also, his campaign definitely has a significant problem with black support, especially. He's right. trailing at 3% nationally with black voters. So, uh, and, and of course, as you uh, also know, Pete has a history uh, with uh, the way he has dealt with uh, issues that pertain to the African-American community in uh, South Bend, Indiana, where he was mayor. So... Uh, that is uh, a little bit of dark irony there that they uh, chose to make sure that his rural white voters that were already getting a disproportional electoral uh, say uh, would continue to have a disproportional electoral say in comparison to the overwhelmingly uh, uh, black and brown workers that were in these satellite caucuses. Um, yeah. 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 No, that that is like a, a dispassionate recitation of the facts like that. Like that's what's so appalling. That's that's exactly what happened here. Uh, you know, once it became clear that these uh, workers and other uh, members of marginalized communities that that the Buttigieg campaign and every other campaign had ignored, you know, might actually tip the balance for Bernie Sanders, then the the posture toward them went from ignoring them to um, trying to diminish the impact that they could have on the election. It it, it, it couldn't be. Uh, they couldn't be bolder than that. It, you know, if you're the Democratic Party, and there are two plausible interpretations of how these uh, satellite caucuses should be interpreted, and they're, and they're both close to each other, you would think that the Democratic Party, which talks a big game about inspiring you know, people of color to show up for them, would err on the side of giving them slightly more weight rather than slightly less. Um, and you would think that the Buttigieg campaign you know, with all of its problems that it has with minority voters, um, you know, would tread a little bit lightly in this area. Uh, you would be wrong. Yeah. 
Um, so we talked about the the uh, the outsized influence that the satellite caucuses potentially could have had, according to the Buttigieg campaign. And then let's move on to uh, let's move on to what happened last night. So uh, earlier in the day, after this call was made, as you also mentioned, Tom Perez decided to call for a recanvas. Uh, a recanvassing right. for those of you who don't know is <laughs> so basically yeah. uh, is just a recount of all of the votes of all the ballots and and uh, and obviously this was um this was unexpected considering that the last three percent where bernie was slated to surge uh, uh was was expected to be released in the morning and that was already kind of interesting that they stopped it at 97 percent and then they decided to re-canvas in the morning. So Bernie came out and said, I won Iowa. Uh, and uh, he said, I won 6,000 more votes in the first round, which was definitely, I mean, it's definitely true. And he also almost won close to 3,000 votes in the second realignment as well. Uh, and the, the SDEs being so close to one another with glaring errors as reported by the New York Times. According to the New York Times, there's more than 100 reporting errors in the application and uh, in the overall results that do not match up with the reality inside of those caucuses. Uh, we don't even know, uh, uh, and this is Nate Cohn from the New York Times upshot saying this, not me. Uh, uh, Nate Cohn stated that we might never know what the actual results were. So considering the fact that there is this complicated math in the SDEs and the way that delegates are assigned, there's also coin tosses, uh, for those of you who don't know, and, and um, like a weighted distribution of, of uh, electoral, um, electoral outcomes. It seemed really reasonable, in my opinion at least, considering the fact that people just also had uh, claimed that he was uh, the victor for the past three news cycles at this point, for Bernie Sanders to come out and say, no, I won. I won 6,000 more votes in the first round. And, and on top of that, like this is a contested SDE. Uh, the, if we're if we're going to operate on this archaic method of SDEs, even then it is a statistical tie. It is a virtual tie, 26% uh, across the board. And where I'm from, 6,000 votes means you won. And I think that is true. Yeah. I, I I agree with that. Now, if there was yeah. a if there was an actual significant, not even like a statistical tie, but like if there was a three point or four point lead in percentage points with Pete Buttigieg's allocation of SDEs. I would have a different opinion on this. Uh, I would still be frustrated with the archaic method and with the glaring, uh, with the glaring problems in reporting. But um, considering that it is a statistical tie with this weird mathematical equation that they've come up with, and uh, considering that there was such an obvious wide margin in popular votes, it's completely unfair that uh, CNN crowned Pete Buttigieg the victor last night. <laughs> in the uh town halls i don't know if you watched that we were talking about that earlier on twitter but um that's yeah. what happened yeah and, and six thousand votes was actually about three points yeah um, you know it's not a small it's not a small number that is it's a more... wider margin of victory than hillary clinton's popular right. vote victory in 2016 which is something that you guys should always remind liberals of because they love to talk about that they love to talk about how hillary clinton won you know this number of uh more popular votes than donald trump Except, yeah. I guess the electoral college system is better when there's coin tosses in rural districts okay. and and random uh, random number of delegates assigned to rural districts. Then it's okay when Pete Buttigieg like can't even win. Yeah. <laughs> now the funny thing is that uh, um, the Iowa Democratic Party rejected Tom Perez's suggestion, his order. Um, they put out a statement saying that we are ready and willing to accept a re-canvas request from anybody who is eligible to make and that is any of the campaign that participate in other words tom perez you're you don't have standing to like order us to do a re-canvas and so the they just put out a little bit ago a statement saying that they were going to extend the deadline until monday for campaigns to request that and also for campaigns to submit um, documentation of discrepancies which is itself absurd because all the documentation is in press releases it's in new york times articles it's on twitter like iowa democratic party do your job but okay like if 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 they need the bernie sanders campaign to forward them <laughs> the email in the new york times article that is already public then i guess they're okay fine uh do that and then uh the party it, it, 
ironic. Okay, so think about that. If it's Monday at noon, that is the deadline for this, and they start, um, you know, looking at these discrepancies throughout Monday afternoon, it's it's plausible they could release um, a new winner of the state delegate equivalents on Tuesday morning while people are on their way to vote in the New Hampshire primary, which would be just hilarious. Yeah. Um, so that was my speculation early on. I, I, I'll admit here, I, I've talked about this even before the Iowa caucuses started. I said that uh, my prediction was that the DMR polls results were correct and that Elizabeth Warren was going to be in second place. I was also surprised by the Pete Buttigieg surge. Uh, I did not realize the realignments would be so effective in pushing Pete Buttigieg over the top. And, um, and that's something I did, could not predict either. But on top of that, I knew that if there wasn't a wide margin of victory for Bernie Sanders in both the SDE counts and in also in the first alignment and second alignments, that even even then, uh, even with a wide margin of victory, they, the media would most likely still say this is actually a victory for the unknown mayor of South Bend, Indiana, against the behemoth right. of Bernie Sanders, which is precisely the way that it's been covered now. It's being covered that way on CNN, despite the fact that The New York Times, uh, the, uh, the NBC News Desk, and the Associated Press have decided that it is impossible to call this vo uh, election. I don't think it's impossible to call it. I think that the victor, the clear victor in this circumstance, given that the uh, given the glaring failures of the SDEs uh, and given how close uh, uh, the the race was in the final results with all of the re reported errors, even the person with 6,000 more votes, I think, won. Um, but that's not what we're hearing from the media, um, because I think that the media is biased. That sounds totally reasonable. Um, now, I, I do think it's also, and I'd, I'd be curious to get your take on this. I think there there should be a little bit of reflection on the part of some of the the online left who, throughout the fall, was kind of rooting for Pete Buttigieg, uh, and even up through um, Caucus Day over the weekend and in Caucus Day, you saw a lot of people say, like on on the left saying, you know, the first thing you should do is is go out and caucus for Bernie. But if you're not going to caucus for Bernie Sanders, then you should do it for Pete, Pete Buttigieg and pray, pray for Pete Buttigieg because, you know, if Buttigieg rises, then that then that hurts Joe Biden and it hurts hurts Elizabeth yeah. Warren. And I'm not like whenever you get too clever in your in your tactics um, and you think you're outsmarting the system, that is when you have to start to be careful, uh, just like when Hillary Clinton thought that she had figured out. Her yeah, Donald Trump was going to be easy to defeat. White. And th there's been a t there's been a ton of examples um, of that happening where you, I mean, just look at Saudi Arabia. They're like, oh, here's a great idea. What we can do if we want to deal with our internal problem is we can just, uh, you know, fund a bunch of Wahhabist schools out you know, around the Middle East and Pakistan. You know, what, what, what could go wrong there? Or like or the uh, Republican Party thinking that it could outside some of its anger to the Tea Party and then the Tea Party taking over the, the establishment like. You know, you, 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 start, you start playing in those sandbox you never kind of um, dragons you're going to build. And so now here comes, here comes Buttigieg surging um, in New Hampshire. Now, I, I do think that the analysis that people have had that he, you know, he's dead man walking because he has no support among voters of color, you know, is, is still legit. But you're, that you're, you're, banking, you're banking an awful lot on that. If think, imagine a world where it was where where Bernie and Elizabeth Warren were, were one and two um, coming out of Iowa, the entire kind of media conversation would be, you know, progressive surge. You know, the left, the left is rising, you know, wither, wither centrist Democrats. And I know that, like, a lot of you know Bernie supporters think that Warren is you know a complete shill and not not part of the, the progressive <laughs> movement. But that's not what the media thinks. So the media narrative yeah. would be, this is, you know, this is a progressive surge. And then voters, Democratic voters, would be like, okay, progressive surge. Like, that's what I'm on board for, you know, because so many Democratic voters are just followers. But don't um, you think, Ryan, and I think this is where we do have a bit of a disagreement. Do, do I think Pete Buttigieg is infinitely, significantly worse and a bigger threat not uh, electoral, not like with his electoral chances, of course, but a significant threat if he became uh, the Democratic nominee. Yes, absolutely. I think he is a much more significant threat than Elizabeth Warren. But as far as thinking about this from the from the point of view of just the primaries 
and uh, the back and forth between uh, Elizabeth Warren and Pete Buttigieg. I think that Pete Buttigieg is definitely different uh, and and much more has much more noticeable differences. <laughs> you get by the way, you're taking taking yeah. advantage of public transportation. All right, you got it. Um, uh, I think that Pete Buttigieg is a better second place than Elizabeth Warren. I do. I I agree. I hadn't really considered the the uh, media narrative of the progressive surge. Uh, I, I had not really considered that point of view. But um, as far as uh, as far as considering like the differences, the, the obvious differences between Pete Buttigieg and Bernie Sanders, um, I think that. Uh, Elizabeth Warren in second place with all of her, her calls for unity in the party and how she is seen right. as the progressive who's going to be the great uniter. Uh, I think that that is much more threatening. As someone who likes Bernie Sanders and wants Bernie Sanders to win, I also thought that that would be um, a, a bigger threat in uh, leading up to New Hampshire, especially because Elizabeth Warren also had more money at a certain point than Pete Buttigieg did or a broader base of support uh, that is similar to uh, hold on. Just if you can hold on to your microphone a little bit when the wind is coming. Sorry about that. How's that? Um, much better. So Elizabeth Warren. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you might be right. I think. I mean, I think that's a legitimate counter. I think it's a legitimate, legitimate counter argument that uh, Bernie and Warren coming out of New Hampshire and Iowa um, together like increases the chances that one of those two is going to be nominated, but it probably decreases the chance that Sanders is nominated. Yeah. Because Warren has a better chance of winning over that centrist wing of the and corporate wing of the party than, than Sanders does. Whereas if it's Sanders versus Buttigieg, um, Sanders has, stands a much better chance. We haven't even talked about Michael Bloomberg, of course. Yeah. Uh, well, Complete let's, wild let's, card let's talk about Michael Bloomberg as well. Uh, wait, you, do you have any more time or are you? I got another five minutes or so. Okay, perfect. So I think that's a good uh, opportunity to move on to the next part of this conversation, which is mini Mike B, a.k.a. Michael Bloomberg. The DNC has uh, readjusted the rules to let Michael Bloomberg uh, join the join the uh, the debate stage uh, before Nevada, right? Not tonight. Um, I, yeah, I think it's, it's definitely not tonight. I think it's going to be next, yeah. the Nevada one. Yeah, the Nevada, the Nevada debates, he will be able to join. And, I mean, this is pay for play. This is pay to play, uh, pretty much uh, the best example of this. Uh, and it's happening right in front of us. I find it personally laughable that uh, Democrats, especially establishment Democrats, consistently weaponize the conversation about the unification of the party and consistently yeah. weaponize the conversation of, of <coughs> Bernie's not a Democrat, but then turn around and are changing the rules uh to to let in a republican george w bush supporter iraq supporter who is most famous for the racially charged stop and frisk policies that he uh accelerated greatly in new york and and who's a billionaire on top of that so um it is insane yeah although that what, what 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 makes it funny is that it's not obvious though that bloomberg actually wanted to be in the debates yet um there was reporting that it was warren's campaign that was pushing to get Bloomberg on the stage. Really? Um, and, that, and there was some reporting that some elements of the Sanders campaign wanted that too because their, their theory is that Bloomberg comes off great in these television ads that are cut by the most talented operatives and uh, kind of ad makers that money can buy, but he does not come off well in person. Well, like he yeah, does, he, he is just... deeply unlikable. Actually, you know what? I, I do think that that would look good. That would even vilify Tom Steyer a little bit. Or maybe it might have a counter. Uh, it, it might have a different effect on Tom Steyer looking actually like a human being. and, and Right, very likable. right. It might. People are like, oh, this is, a ni this is the nice billionaire Yeah, he's the good billionaire versus the bad one. Because Michael Bloomberg no, so, is really bad. Yes, and their theory is like the more people actually see of Mike Bloomberg... Um, the worse they will respond to him. Whereas if he can just um, interact with voters through the medium of his slick 30 second ads, then he's going to keep rising in the polls. So that's kind of the, um, that's kind of the gamble that I think some of the other campaigns were taking. I, and I think Bloomberg was actually pretty comfortable um, to just sit on the sidelines and pump money into the super Tuesday States and let the other candidates kill each other. Probably. Um, so um, yeah. it is it is hilarious, though, that like um, they couldn't find a way to t to slightly tweak the rules 
so that it wasn't just all white people on the stage. Um, but they did find a way to tweak the rules to get this guy on. Like, there's no, there's no doubt that that is peak Democratic Party establishment behavior. I know. It's, it's, also pretty, it's also pretty transparent where their allegiances lie when you consider uh, exactly what you said, like people of color uh, versus working people of America versus a billionaire. I mean, the Democratic Party is, yeah. very, is very much the corporatist party now. They are virtually uh, no different than the Republican Party uh, when they do stuff like this. I think that this plays really poorly um, towards uh, people's opinion of the Democratic Party, uh, especially when you consider um, the actions that they take uh, as far as like tax cuts for the wealthy and whatnot. Um, this plays along to that message that like the Republican Party is actually the party of the workers and the working class because we do racial agitation just like you, you know? <laughs> you you hate yeah. Mexicans and we hate Mexicans too. So at least they like offer something to workers in America, and and just uh, poor people and and middle class in general. Whereas the the Democratic Party almost openly shows disdain, um, right? Whenever they are um, in the way that they cover this, uh, in the way that they cover these issues. Yep. And if you do show up, then they're going to do what they can to diminish the impact of the vote that you cast. It's it's appalling. Yeah. So. Oh. Any any last thoughts? I, I feel like you're. I get the feeling that you're, you're trying to run away here. Well, yeah, I'm home, and my wife's not feeling good, so I came home a little early. Okay, well, don't show any any discernible uh, landmarks behind you then. <laughs> okay. Just a bunch of just a bunch of trees. Yeah. Uh. Anyway. Okay. So, so anything anything else that you wanna you wanna say before you leave? Um. Well, last time I told people to go uh, review my book and give it five stars on Amazon, and a bunch of people did. So I appreciated that. Um, so if people did buy my book, we've got people, they should go, go review it. Cause it actually really helps with the hell yeah al algorithm and all that shit. Um, <sighs> and if they haven't bought it yet, they should do that. All right. Well, that's perfect. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ryan for coming on and yeah, man. I, I happy hope to you, do it. And hopefully, uh, we'll have you on sooner. Uh, again, wait, are you covering the debates tonight? Where are you going to cover it? Yeah, I'll be just at home. Oh, just at home. Wait, do you want to yeah. come on here and talk about it more, or are you going to do it for oh, yeah. someone else? No, no, I'm not doing it. I could pop on for a little bit. Oh, hell yeah. Okay. All right. All well, right. that's awesome, man. That's that's great. That actually gets me super stoked. Excellent. We stole him, me we too. Stole him back from the hill. <laughs> we stole him back from Crystal Ball chat. We did it. All right, yeah, well, they're not doing so anything tonight. On, they're beat. All right. All right. See you, man.